blue guy, more like Far Cry. I cried, but these were not fun tears, they were frontiers of Pandora which has been one of the most miserable gaming experiences of my entire life. I walked away from every play session feeling drained and an absolute befuddlement of how a video game can be this boring. The open world is as empty as the open ocean. The fun is as difficult to find as unobtainium. The combat is as clunky as James Cameron's dialogue. The enemies are so dumb that they'll literally just stand in the middle of a poison cloud for two minutes until they choke on it and die. There's only two enemy types in the entire game and the side activities are absolutely Absolutely mind numbing. Needless to say, it's a pretty bad game, folks, and pretty excited to dive into it with you guys. I think you're in for a treat. Remember how after the first Avatar movie came out, people developed severe depression because they loved Pandora so much that they wanted to go there themselves, but couldn't since it's not real? Well, ironically enough, after spending 30 hours in Pandora, Avatar has actually given me depression and made me blue. They say it's not easy being green, but it's way more difficult to be blue. I've tried to continue living my life as normal, but when I go out to eat or to the store, people give me weird looks. They treat me differently. What's that? <laughs> I'm sorry. Everywhere I go, I'm reminded of Pandora. Hello. Hi. How you doing today? I'm okay. I'm a little feeling a little blue. That's fair. I feel it. People think I'm strange because I'm bluish. I think you're cold. Yeah, a little. <laughs> but I can't help that I'm blue. So, I've been trying to figure out how to get rid of my blues, but I haven't had any luck so far. An open world game is only as good as the open world within it, and Pandora is truly beautiful. There are so many sights to see, and so many things to do, each more exciting than the last, like brushing the air and a memory painting activity. Following a trail of butterflies for two minutes as they lead you to a fruit that you can pick. Locating an ancient Sarantu shrine and looking for an arrow on the ground nearby it, which you then follow to find another arrow, which you then follow to find another arrow, which you then do again three or four more times until you reach the observation point where you hold the E key to complete this activity for no reward. A lonely totem on a hill between a forest and the mountains above a vast valley. There's abandoned RDA bases that you need to hack and RDA bases that you need to liberate. There's these giant closed up mushrooms with loot inside of them, which you need to open by following a trail of mushrooms for 30 seconds, which leads you to another mushroom that you need to touch. Now you just follow three more mushroom trails and touch three more mushrooms to open up the big mushroom and reap your reward. A piece of food and a well-earned one at that. These are all the side activities in the game. Needless to say, they're kind of boring. But what else is there to do? Well, I'll tell you. There are dynamic events that happen randomly throughout the world, which do try to spice things up. Like maybe you'll stumble into an animal who's been tagged with an RDA tracer dart, and you need to hold the E key to walk up to it slowly, like Christopher Pratt, and pull it out. Go on, you're free. Maybe you'll find a bunch of mechs who are shooting wildly into the jungle for no reason other than to alert the player of their existence that have captured an animal, and you need to kill them to set it free. I'm pretty sure those are the only two dynamic events in the game. If there are more, they never spawned in for me. There's also a lot of plants lying around that you can touch, which either permanently increase your health or give you skill points for free. But I almost never died, so I didn't need more health and I got more than enough skill points from completing side quests and the main quest anyway. So I didn't really need to search for these. And even worse, Pandora feels so empty. You never see other Na'vi traveling throughout the world. The Na'vi that you do find out in the wild just stay in one spot and never move from that one spot. In fact, no matter where they are, the Na'vi rarely ever move. There are a few Na'vi who walk around a scripted path in the safe zones, even if you're in that scripted path. 
But they are rare, and sometimes during story missions, other Na'vi will walk and you're forced to follow them, but that's it. Apart from that, you never see Na'vi moving on their own, which means we never see them hunting wildlife, running from wildlife, fighting the RDA, or interacting with the environment at all. Which is partially why this world feels so lifeless. And I'm sorry to say that Pandora is actually pretty lame. I think we can all agree that Spotify is much better. Okay, so to be clear, Avatar Frontiers of Pandora, or AFOP as it's called, is far, far worse than Far Cry 6. There are no companions, there are no stealth takedowns, the villain has absolutely no presence at all throughout the entire main story, and there's no wingsuit. So I've got to get some distance from that game and reacclimate with society. Oh yeah. See, I forged a very deep bond with my car. She won't stop talking right now, but she is very happy to see me. And she likes it when I turn her on. What's that, babe? Oh, she needs gas. Traversal and movement is really boring. You literally just run in a straight line from one objective to the next, and that's pretty much it. The jumping, clambering, and sliding does feel fluid, but it doesn't have any depth to it. There's these blue plants lying around the place, and when a Na'vi gets a whiff of this stuff, it juices him up, causing him to run much faster. On top of that, there's also some plants that explode when you go near them, and there's also some plants that you can bounce off of like a trampoline, and those give you a speed boost too. And then there are these leaves that launch you really far when you step on them, but I've pretty much only ever found these during the scripted linear sections of the game, and rarely out in the open. So initially, I thought that maybe Ubisoft intended for me to try and chain all these plants together, right? Like go from blue plant to trampoline to landing on an explosive plant for a sick little combo, which would give you something to do while going from one place to the next, but this isn't the case. Sometimes on a big old tree branch you'll find a trail of the blue plants to follow, and on occasion you'll find one sitting around out in the open, but that's about it. Generally these plants are just strewn about without much thought. Now there was a lot of potential behind this idea here. Imagine if almost everything in the environment offered a mobility boost of some kind. Like maybe you could kick off the side of a tree to pick up some speed, wall run off the side of a rock, pole vault swing off of branches like Doom Guy, use vines as a zip line, swing from vine to vine, pull a giant tree branch back and let it go to make it launch you like a slingshot into the air, slide down slopes to pick up speed like Titanfall. Because somehow, sliding downhill does not allow you to pick up speed in this game. Which is absurd to me. But then chaining all of those moves together would have the player enter a flow state. And the more you use the environment, the deeper you'll go into that flow state, and the deeper you are in flow, the faster you move. Not only would this add significant depth to the traversal, but it would also incentivize the player to look at the environment completely differently than he would in any other open world game. It would also give you some really neat options for entering and exiting combat, and it would also serve to deepen the player's connection with the environment, in turn making you feel as though you are more connected to Pandora, which would not only be way more fun, but also thematically accurate. Fact is, I get way more enjoyment from traversing in my car than I do in this game. But that's only because we're so close. Luckily though, it's not long until you unlock an Ikran, which is just a giant bird that allows you to travel faster, but not faster than a fast travel, unfortunately. I actually kind of enjoyed the mission where you bond with the Ikran specifically because it was linear, so the game was able to give me gentle guidance on where to go without being too obvious. The view was amazing, the music was in perfect sync with what I was doing, and this was absolutely giving me Avatar vibes, and I was kind of able to lose myself in this a little bit. The music is far and away the best part of this game. They really did the movies justice with it, and it just goes to show how much of an atmosphere good music can convey while also covering up bad gameplay. At times it made AFOP tolerable, which is extremely high praise. But then, disappointment settled in yet again when I learned that flying is no more fun than walking. Because to get from A to B, you literally just fly in a straight line while mashing the spacebar. There are helicopters in the sky that can mess with you, or you can do combat with them, but none of them ever detected me. And there are other big birds out there that can kill you, but that almost never happens. When you're riding this thing, it should 
feel as though you've mounted an unruly beast with a mind of its own. It should feel kind of sluggish at first, fighting against you a little bit, not going quite as fast as you want it to, but then as the game progresses and your bond deepens, the controls become tighter. You know, something like that. At the very least, you should be able to hear this thing's thoughts or be able to communicate with it somehow. Ubisoft had an opportunity here to give us a first-person perspective on what it's like to actually bond with an Ikran, but they completely blew it. I think there needs to be some kind of in-game system that revolves around that, because I never felt any sort of connection to this thing. To me, it was just a fleshy vehicle that would form in front of me with the press of a button, and all it did was get me from A to B in a straight line. So you know what I would do to pass the time while I was flying in a straight line? I actually played another game, War Thunder, today's sponsor. But I decided to do this ad read in the beautiful language of the people of Pandora. Not the, it is the Ha'i people's most comprehensive vehicle some uvansi ever up. Nenga can be like the Ha'i people. Ote fike i the air, kamakto on the apska, ute sail on the sea. Uvan si ni ulten 2,000 tanks, helicopters, si ships, every ship lu ni tsan hainoting sail spa. War Thunder welcomes people of all skill levels, whether you're a pro or a navi is. Da uvan lux tumpsel yuipsel Pandora hootsals 4K graphics. Uvan si kaut sunset sin PC, Xbox, PlayStation. Stefza da tare mi la atsu ne uvan si War Thunder. Sete oe katsal tontarel aru six. So since I'm transitioning from Pandora to reality, I thought it would be a good idea to come out here to the old Navi so that I can buy myself some clothes to try and hide this blueness. Uh, I'll see you guys inside. So the leveling system in this game is pretty uninspired. They pretty much stole it straight from Destiny 2. Your character's power level is merely a representation of the gear you're wearing. So this shirt here might bump me up to level 5, and this jacket here might just bump me down to level 4. Meaning you're constantly going into your menu to swap out your old clothes with new clothes. Making a number go up is nice, but it feels arbitrary because it has no impact on gameplay. So for example, to level up you also equip stronger shotguns, bows, and assault rifles throughout the game. But all these weapons are functionally identical. A 28 damage bow operates exactly the same as a bow that does 21 damage. And it's the same for every other weapon in the game. So you never actually feel more powerful, you just have a higher number. But what's even worse than that are the skills in the skill tree. These have got to be the most uncreative and boring skills I've ever seen. 5% boost to damage, 10% boost to damage, 25% boost to weakness spot damage, food you eat lasts twice as long, permanent health increases. But you see, these are not skills. Rather, they're passive buffs and they add nothing to the gameplay. There are a couple of skills that are actual skills, like sprinting is now completely silent, and a couple of others, but there's only a handful of these, right? So interestingly, there are other skills you can go find out in the wild, like a double jump or being able to rip a pilot out of its mech. These are abilities that have genuine impact on gameplay for the most part, but to unlock them, all you need to do is go to them on your map, and once you get to them, you hold the E key, and now that ability is all yours. So you don't need to prove yourself to AWA by completing a task that relates to the ability you unlock. Instead, the game just gives it to you practically for free. Now, these abilities should have been swapped. You put those 10% damage buffs and food buffs out in the wild so that we can go unlock those for no effort, but have us actually unlock the double jump and the fall damage dampener in the skill tree. That way, we would actually feel like we're upgrading our character. Because towards the middle of the game, I had already gotten every skill I wanted. So I just started unlocking them all in order since it really didn't matter anymore. Because if I'm already one-shotting all of the enemies in the game, then why would I need a 10% damage buff? The side quests in this game are more like back quests as they don't even deserve to be anywhere near the front. So there's a bunch of side quests that have you partake in the game's investigation mechanic. But what else? I guess the folks over at Ubisoft took a look at Batman and LA Noir and said, yeah, you know what? Something like that would be perfect in our Avatar game. Not only does this not fit into the game, but they significantly dumbed down the mechanics of this. What they did was they implemented a system where you hold E to start the investigation. I wonder if... And to progress the investigation, you need to find another item nearby that is loosely related to the first item you investigated. 
DeLuca ejected during the crash. But here's the thing, sometimes there are up to five more items lying around that you need to check out. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason as to which of the two items are linked. I don't think so. Doesn't look right. So you just kind of cycle through them all until you find the right one. RDA aircraft. Gets attacked midair, takes damage, parts fall out of the sky, something hits that tree. And after finding two that match, you need to find another two that also match. I wonder if... Mm, that's not it. No. But what else? Hunter calls Ikran. RDA sees it, tries to kill it. Ikran, Hunter, both take off. In a hurry. You do this over and over again until the bar on the upper left of the screen fills up, but what this really boils down to is you constantly activating your Na'vi vision while spinning around in circles, walking back and forth, maybe you go up to some high ground to get a better vantage point before finally stumbling on the thing that you need to find because some of these items are incredibly well hidden. I once spent upwards of five minutes searching a particular area only to discover that the thing I needed to scan were a couple of bullet holes on the wall that my Na'vi vision didn't pick up. I don't know how anybody is supposed to find this in a game that has so much visual clutter. Searching aimlessly for stuff like this is the absolute last thing I want to be doing in my free time with a video game. And once you solve the investigation, you're shown a scent trail that you need to follow. And once you reach the end of it, you either fight something or talk to someone, and then you're done. I've had side quests in real life that offered more depth. Hey, can I, can I get you a YouTube video? You wanna, you wanna put me on YouTube? Yeah, it's, it's an interview. Okay, yeah. yeah all, right. all right, so if you look into go date a girl, what's like the biggest turnoff for you? If she's white. If she's white, what you wanted to be, bro? Blue. You wanted to be blue? Yeah. All right, bro. That's gonna get on me? I spent two to three collective hours just searching for stuff in this game, especially because the UI is so damn awful. Sometimes I would track a quest in the quest tab, and then when I would try to find it in the map, I couldn't because the map is so cluttered with a bunch of bright, vibrant colors, making everything blur together. I'd sometimes spend over a minute just looking for my quest objective. Then, the environments themselves are visually overstimulating. See, the problem is they focused too much on making these environments pretty, rather than playable. There's nothing in the visual design to give the player any sort of hint for as to where to go. So like, look at this for example, I wanted to get the skill point flower inside of this tree, but I couldn't because there was an invisible wall blocking me. So I spent an entire minute walking around this entire tree to find the entrance. And this is what happens a majority of the time you want to enter an optional area in this game. So I meant it when I said that I spent a collective two to three hours in this game just trying to find stuff. The rest of the side quests are pretty standard stuff. You got fetch quests, maybe a standoff type deal where you need to defend an area from a horde of enemies. And there are a handful of side quests that involve gathering materials for cooking and hunting, which is not only tedious, but you also really don't need to gather any materials to cook with because you find random food lying inside of these baskets that appear all over the place. And you don't need to hunt because you won't need to use the animal meat for food since, again, you already get food from these baskets. Baskets. And you won't need to use the animal parts for crafting materials to craft more powerful gear, since you already get more powerful gear by completing main quests. And sometimes you can even get better gear from talking to random strangers that are just hanging out. And I found that if you initiate a conversation with another Navi, and then immediately run away from them, you'll still get whatever item they were going to give to you, it just teleports into your inventory. And the rewards that you get from these strangers are just as good as the rewards you'd get for completing side quests and open world activities, making the side quests worthless. You know it's important to take breaks, drink some water, and eat some food when you're playing video games, which is why I came out here to my favorite restaurant, Pandora Bread. It's pretty good here, even if their sauce is a little avatart. And they always get my name wrong. When I review a game like AFOP, it is the only thing I play, and I play it to an obsessive degree. I've done this with Far Cry 6, Starfield, and now AFOP. It's been pretty miserable. I play it until it becomes all that I know, until I see it in my dreams. And I think that might be why I turned blue. But despite the health risks, I'm gonna keep using this method. I'm actually really excited to experience cyberpunk like this. So you can expect a cyberpunk review in a couple of months. But for now, I gotta fight this blueness. By eating some greens.
you only have a small handful of weapons to choose from. You got a bow and arrow, a heavy bow and arrow, a short bow and arrow, a lacrosse stick that throws bombs and poison clouds, a spear thrower, an assault rifle, and a shotgun. I actually hated using the assault rifle because it felt so bad. The reload animation is stiff and it takes forever, the gun doesn't sound very impressive, and it doesn't do very much damage. It also feels clunky and has a significant amount of bloom, so you can't really use it for long-range encounters. At least the shotgun is really powerful. In fact, it might be a little too strong. But despite being powerful and reliable, it just never felt fun to use. And much like the assault rifle, the reload animation here was stiff and lengthy, and now I do get that I'm playing as a Navi, and guns are not only foreign to them, but also small in their big blue hands. So I could see people using that logic to defend this game. But it doesn't feel as though that my character is unfamiliar with these weapons. The fact is, Ubisoft just made weapons that are inherently unsatisfying to use. To make matters worse, there's only two enemy types. Three if you count the helicopter. You got guys with guns and guys in mechs. Guys with guns are pretty much just fodder. They die in one hit from an arrow and one hit from a fist. The guys in mechs are a bit more complex. There's a couple different variants of these. There's a guy in a mech suit with no protection, so he also dies in one shot. There's a guy in a mech with glass on the front of it, so if you stun it, you can rip the pilot out of the mech. And I don't think you need me to tell you that the animation for ripping somebody out of their mech looks unfinished. They also use the same animation every single time, so you'll see this a lot throughout the game. You'll stop having to watch this animation when you get to the third and final mech in the late game, which has impenetrable armor and you just need to kill it from a distance. So I played this on the hardest difficulty, and it was still pretty easy, especially since you can fully heal yourself with the press of a button. And you don't need to wait for an animation to play out like in Far Cry 6 or anything like that. You just press the heal button and you have full health immediately. The combat feels so sloppy. It's like Ubisoft just did the bare minimum to get combat functioning so they could get this game out the door. See, like, the humans have a technological advantage on us, but it never feels that way because we're constantly using their weapons against them. And somehow, my wooden arrows are stronger than the blades of a helicopter. Ubisoft should have gone all in with the fact that we're Na'vi. Don't let us keep human weapons on us at all times. Make it so that we can grab them off the ground, and once they run out of ammo, we throw it away. That would make combat feel dynamic, as we'd have to constantly be scrambling to find weapons on the ground. But let's take it a step further. Let us go over to a downed mech and grab its arm to use as a stationary turret during combat. And maybe later on, you could unlock a skill that lets you rip that arm out of its socket and move around the arena with it. Instead of a shotgun, give me a slingshot that we can load unobtainium into to break the glass of a mech. Give me a melee weapon that was made from the bones of a Sturm Beast that I can use to smack people with and send them flying. Because right now, there aren't even any melee weapons in the game. The combat has no gimmicks, there is no depth, the enemies shoot at you, and you shoot at them, taking cover whenever necessary and fully healing yourself with the press of a button. I stumbled upon an RDA base that was at level 20, but I was at level 7. I was sick of playing by this game's rules, so I decided that I was going to sabotage this base right here, right now, no matter what. But first I needed to find a way in. Looking up at the giant metal walls of this complex felt all too similar to looking up at the impressive concrete walls of the mall, another facility that I wanted to sneak into undetected, as I needed to buy a topical skin cream to finally get rid of my blues. Eventually I was able to find a vent that I could sneak in through. But in real life, I wound up just using the front door. Once inside, I realized that all of my enemies were at such a high level that the mechs are literally invincible to me. And they kill me in one hit. But this did not deter me. Because as luck would have it, I could still kill the human enemies in just one shot. So I knew this was possible. I was one lowly Na'vi tribesman, stacked against the odds. They had military training, higher numbers, and much better weaponry than me. I barely stood a chance. I wasn't supposed to be here. And this is exactly how it should feel being a Na'vi standing up to the might of the Earth's military. But I also wasn't supposed to be here. I was getting strange looks. Some would chuckle, others would dodge eye contact. 
this is not how going to the mall is supposed to feel. The first room was the easiest of the bunch. I just killed all the humans and hacked this terminal when the mech wasn't looking. However, the second room must have taken me 30 minutes of trial and error. I eventually got into a rhythm of marking all the enemies in the room, killing every human one by one, breaking into this vent, killing the last guy and hacking another terminal, which of course sets off an alarm and alerts all the enemies to my exact location and gives me a new objective, survive the cargo trench counter attack. In other words, I was now meant to kill every single enemy, including the mechs. I found that I could stun a mech with my stun grenades and rip the pilot out of it. A nice little exploit. But doing this made a lot of noise. It also left me exposed and could get me killed. To make matters worse, there were mechs that had armor and were impervious to this tactic, so I did my best to stay out of sight, sticking to the shadows, clinging to the walls, making sure not to be seen by anyone. And I was successful in my endeavors. And after hiding long enough, the game decided it would throw me a bone by completing the objective for me up top there, and opening a door that would allow me to progress. My heart pounded as I waited for the right moment to make my way to the door. mission never ended. The next area took me another 30 minutes. I'd kill every human I could. More enemies would spawn in beneath me. But I discovered that when I would walk up to this metal ramp, that it would despawn those enemies. If only I could find some way to despawn all these people in the mall. I hack another terminal, once again alerting every enemy in the room to my exact location, so I hide. I found out that if I crouch under this staircase here, the enemy can't get to me and will eventually give up searching for me as a result. Sometimes the best thing you can do is hide in plain sight. I blow up another gas pipe and make my way to the next room, which is of course being guarded by an invincible mech. Here I was at last at the final arena. And just like every other encounter in this entire base, if I died in here, there are no checkpoints. So I'll get thrown back into the very beginning of this encounter. And folks, this encounter is long. This single room took me about an hour and a half. I died over and over again, but eventually I got it down to a good routine. See, there's three mechs and three guys here, but if you kill four out of these six enemies, the game will spawn reinforcements. So I found it was best to just kill three and leave the other three and sneak around them. Then I would shoot the laser in the eye, which exposes three valves. I would turn all three valves shoot an explosive which alerts the enemies to my exact location again, forcing me to really think about my movement and positioning. I would then shoot the eye again, which would allow me to turn three more valves, which would then allow me to shoot another explosive. And now, after all of that, I'm finally able to damage the laser. And I struggled a lot here, until I discovered that you can sit in this pipe thing and the enemies can't get to you, they can't even see you. So I just hung out in here while taking pot shots at the laser, and I finally did it. I'll be honest with you, I felt pretty accomplished. This was not easy. The rewards were pretty good too. I got a bandana out of it that got me up to level 8. I also got a heavy bow that ranked me up to level 10, and I never unequipped either of these items throughout the rest of my playthrough. In fact, I absolutely loved this bow. It was so overpowered. And ordinarily, I would hate having an overpowered weapon because it makes the game less fun. But the difference here is, unlike unlocking the nail gun early on in Far Cry 6 for simply hitting level 4, I had to earn this bow, thereby earning me the right to break the game. This was the first and only time I had genuine fun in this game. I was engaged. I felt alive, but I was still blue. Do you guys have any kind of like topical skin cream to take care of this blueness? I don't think we do. Dang it. I've tried everything to get rid of Like I've tried canceling it out by eating blue cheese, blue berries, and blue waffles and like nothing. So thank you though. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Overall, the mission design was pretty bad. There was one mission where you got to play as a moth and experience its emotions in real time. It's comfort in confusion. She doesn't know how to get them away. Oh, really? The moth is scared? 
Ah, shucks. Hey, G, you ever wonder why we don't play as moths more in video games? I also did a mission where there was a horde mode where I was meant to defend this position from an onslaught of enemies, but I killed everything much faster than the game intended. So it stopped spawning RDA and I just sat here doing nothing for a minute and a half while I waited for the timer to run out. And then during the main story, the game also forces you to do a whole bunch of those investigations as well. I wonder if which only get more and more frustrating as the game continues. But what's even worse is the game padding. Like, holy hell, check this out. I'll try to keep this brief. So after having blown up an RDA facility, the resistance throws a party to celebrate blowing up the RDA facility. But then the party gets crashed and we get thrown in jail over in another RDA facility. But a Na'vi sympathizer breaks us out of jail and blows up the RDA facility. So now people in our clan are sick and wounded after the attack. So I'm tasked with finding another new clan called the Kamatiri. And I gotta get their healer to help us. But the Kamatiri are known for being reclusive. So I go to their hideout. They aren't there. So I go to their other hideout, finally meet with their clan. But of course their healer, which is some chick named Anufi, is a Luffy, and she's off on her own somewhere in a different hideout. So I go to her hideout. When I finally find her, she's been racked with guilt as she's been told by her chief that one of her concoctions caused an entire tribe to die or something. So now she refuses to heal my people because she thinks she's gonna end up killing them as well. So I go back to the Navi base to talk to the guy that'll tell me how to talk to Anufi, but he isn't here. I'm told he's somewhere else. So I go somewhere else, except he's not here. He's somewhere else. I follow his scent for three minutes, get to an RDA base. There he is, but he wants to get into that room behind him and he can't because there's poison in it. I can't get in there either because there's poison in it. I need special equipment. So I go to another RDA base to steal it. I use that equipment to fix the generator. I vent out all the poison. This guy mixes me a drink that makes me immune to the poison. I take a three minute fly over to another hideout where I'm told I need to go to another RDA base, but my bird can't fly in all this poison. So I take a two minute run to get there. I'm now told that I have to go to another big tree covered in vines, so I take another three minute run to get there. And here we find evidence that the healer lady is in fact not responsible for killing all the Na'vi like she was led to believe. So we go all the way back to the Na'vi base and we tell this guy that she wasn't responsible for killing all the Na'vi like she was led to believe. And what do you think he says to me? He says to me, he says, go tell her that yourself. Uh, okay, yeah. Now, why we didn't do that straight away is beyond me. So we finally tell her. And then the guy who was gaslighting her the whole time gets shunned from the community. And then this new clan becomes part of the resistance. All of that took me two hours. Two hours to tell some lady that she's been gaslit for 20 years. And if that ain't game padding, then I don't know what is. And then right after that, we like we plug into AWA and go into some chick's memories. And ironically enough, this part wasn't very memorable. All of this was unbelievably miserable. I walked away from this play session feeling bluer than before. Here I was 25 hours into this game. I had sat through every cutscene thus far and nothing of any consequence had happened yet. I bonded with an Ikron, I disabled some RDA facilities, and I convinced three clans to fight against the RDA with me. Then the villain probably had 15 minutes of screen time and he was so boring. It's impossible for him to be intimidating because my character is far more powerful than him. I could kill him with a single punch. His motivations are also pretty bland. He just wants to take Pandora's resources by blowing it up up and turning it into an oil field. None of the supporting cast are interesting. They're all one dimensional and none of them show any sort of growth throughout the story or go through any character arcs whatsoever. Then we have the main character who is so unlikable. He sounds like he's always whining and in peril. No! What am I doing wrong? Which just makes him come across as an idiot. Wahoo! Wahoo! Like Mario. Wahoo! And at the very end of the game, we trap the villain against a wall. We are not children. We ought not be. Then we leave the facility and blow up the facility that he's in, killing him in the process. This is gone. At last. Great Nelva, I, I know you must hate me. did it! It's finally over! 
I think I stumbled on the inherent problem with this game. It's that the world of Pandora wasn't made to be played, it was made to be watched. Ubisoft recreated the visuals of Pandora really well, which look great in the movies, but make for an overly cluttered visual mess in the video game. The flora and fauna in the movie were a visual treat, everything there felt right and looked believable. But none of that flora and fauna serves a gameplay purpose, and Ubisoft couldn't really change things up very much to make that flora and fauna work for a gameplay purpose because if they did change things up too much, well then it wouldn't really feel like you were on Pandora now, would it? That's why there's only two enemy types in the game, because in the movies, those were the enemies. Man with gun and man in mech, then sometimes helicopter. If they took creative liberties and added in more enemies, then it wouldn't be consistent with the movies. Ubisoft couldn't really do anything interesting with the story either, because if things got too crazy, they'd be stepping on the toes of the story that the movies are trying to tell. So it's gotta be this weird, contained side story with no real consequence on the Avatar universe. Avatar Frontiers of Pandora sucks because the Avatar IP it's using is shackling them, preventing them from doing anything of Worthington. I think that if you love the movies, you will enjoy the game more. You'll be able to buy into the fantasy much easier. And I can understand why an Avatar fan would just want to boot this game up and run around in Pandora for a bit. However, I do think that AFOP fails to sell that Avatar fantasy. But I think it succeeds in giving the illusion of that fantasy. And that's completely due to the amazing music and beautiful visuals, which are the only two things this game has going for it. At this point in time, a lot of people are enjoying AFOP. And that's fine, you know, let them, they're honeymooning. But within the next couple of weeks, I think they'll realize just how shallow this game is. But if they haven't, then please do me a favor and send them this video. Well, there's nothing to do now, but uninstall the game. Whatever, another 70 bucks down the drain. A waste of damn time. What? And of course, we mustn't forget the most important thing in this entire video. War Thunder. I also gotta give a big shout out to the Patreon people, because each and every dollar that goes into the Patreon goes right back into this channel, which pays for the editing software and props and makeup and that kind of thing. So if you want to see the quality of this channel continue to improve, maybe think about giving a little donie. Well, thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye bye. Life is good when the jungle sun goes up. Tropical. Adventures, a new day, who knows what?